Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on February 12th, 2023. The first reading is Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20, Choose Life. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, Love the Law. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9, Paul says it's not really all about him. Matthew 5, 21 through 37, the antitheses. So I've summarized all four passages there. I think we're pretty much ready to wrap. Yeah, I think so. We're well done. Yeah, you did we're a great job, Matt. It's been great. Thank you. Hard, hard texts this week, but important ones too, I think. Yeah, so we were, I mentioned this last week that one of the challenges, well, one of the issues with the Sermon on the Mount is that we, our last week's text started with, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And then we have uh, 17 through 20 of this invitation to a reinterpretation of scripture or uh, not not necessarily reinterpretation, but of ga- engaging scripture as we talk about what is what is the kingdom of heaven like? What is God calling us to be? What what and and then these definitions and embodiments of righteousness and such and so then from twenty one to forty eight we get examples then of of engaging scripture through the lens of. <laughs> Uh, of an embodied righteousness or what righteousness looks like or what God's, what, what difference does this kingdom of heaven that God is, that Jesus is ushering in now, how does that then demand a reevaluation or, or an engaging scripture in conversation as a, as a, as we evaluate and think about what this means, which at the end of the day is really important, uh, just to just to make a comment about that in general, that it whenever you, whenever we are are called to theological conversation and theological discussion, that one of our primary conversation partners should always be scripture. And and how is it that scripture is front and center in any kind of theological construction or reconstruction or reevaluation or, or or the way in which the way in which churches and denominations and individuals uh, what what are their resources for uh, theological reflection uh, and uh, particularly when there is. Uh, a sense of how theology needs to be reevaluated or 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 we feel a push to a different kind of theological thinking. So that's an aside. I don't know if you think you need to write a you know preach a sermon on the necessity of reinterpretation of scripture for theological imagination and reconstruction. That would not be something that I would necessarily preach on. However, it is important, and it and so what we're getting here, we will not get the whole the whole part of this. We because we end before, uh, but then we go to the we go to uh, we go to the transfiguration. But here we get concerning uh, concerning anger, or the the going back to the law, the you shall not murder, going back to the commandment of of you shall not murder. And then of course, uh, going back to you shall not commit adultery. Okay. What does that now mean through the lens of this present kingdom of heaven, this, this kingdom of heaven, that's coming near this criterion of, of embodying the righteousness of God. And there we go. Yeah. What does it mean? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think we have to think about interpretation of scripture like you're talking about. I think a a preacher too needs to look at this text and then think about from what is Jesus liberating us, Mm. which is always a good question to ask because here it's not fair to say he's liberating us from the law as if the law is some kind of, Mm -mm. this is not Paul, for example. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We also might want to talk about what is the law, which we tend to think about as do this, get rewarded, don't do this, get punished, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
the law, and here the Deuteronomy text is so important, the law is laying out a foundation for where is life to be found and how does community help. So Jesus is not liberating us from the law as if he's saying the law is this conservative, horrible old taskmaster. What he's actually saying is, you know what, the law has a vision for human flourishing that's actually way more, way more demanding than you thought before. So if any of you think that you got the law figured out, I got news for you, right? Because exactly. one, human sin is so pervasive, but also I think what's imagined for a, a thriving human society is so elusive and so mm -hmm. and, and always at risk, which again gets back to that question of why is he so upset about in this gospel and where's the relief that he's promising? And I think it's about this this new community he imagines and he sees the law. And of course we all know the law has got some really weird things in it. I'm not talking about each and every law, but on the whole, he sees the law as this, this roadmap, the wrong word, certainly a pathway toward human flourishing, which he wants to find and to stir up. And he's going to get angry in chapter six about people who practice their righteousness in public. Mm -hmm. He's going to get angry about people who use religion to increase their own status or who use religion to step on others or to increase the burden on others, which is why he's going to get so angry and say, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to get into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, he's mm -hmm. the thing that he's so angry about in this gospel is religion that actually does the opposite of its intention, mm -hmm. that doesn't liberate people, that doesn't lead to life, but that oppresses people that leads to death. And so... I think that's part of what's going on here is in a sense, he's trying to rescue the law from, from religious people who misuse the law as a source of oppression or a source of self, what's the word promotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what I, I think. I, it is. So that's, that just requires oh, yeah. some rethinking about the way we've been taught sometimes to think about law or scripture mm -hmm. or reward punishment. Mm -hmm. I, I, we are not, I agree. Not, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I I I think tone matters in in this and 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 how do we uh what tone are we reading this in? Um uh, so not just the words which the law can become, it can become a list, it beca can become a line uh, that you don't cross or or you have to cross, um uh, uh, a task that are done. Um um, so not just the selected words, but the tone. And I think the tone of this reads to me as a higher standard. And, and, and it's not for status, which I think you're, you're rightly criticizing, um, th that makes Jesus angry, uh, Matt, but it, it, it is a show of possibilities. And both of you have talked about, um, this community forming, um, uh, Caroline, last week you drew, drew us in, um, uh, prepared us even the week before of of to, of of moving from the individual to the y'all to the we uh, to the community. And um, I'll, I'll say more about this when we get to the Deuteronomy text. But uh, um, it's it's a construction manual for uh, for forming community and mm -hmm. the use of these familiar rules to become power over does not form the kind of community of belonging that has been God's intent from the very beginning. Um, the God who said, it is not good for the human to be alone, but has given to humanity the capacity to have uh, creative flourishing in all the world. And, and so this has always been the idea. And yet along the way, groups in power, even those who bear the name of the people of God, have used this to oppress, to, um, uh, to uh, exclude, uh, to burden. And Jesus is saying, this is a place where folks will be healed, where folks will find life where community will bring flourishing. And, and so, yeah, I, I think, I think what you're saying, Matt, is, is, is exactly what this text is challenging us to. And, and if we remember that when Eugene Peterson wrote the message, um, one of the reasons he chose to write it the way he did was he wanted the words that we read in 
uh, our reading of the text to have the same punch that it would have been heard in uh, in the first century. So, if or or before that, if you're reading the the the, um, uh, the Old Testament, um, but if we're reading these texts and our congregation is simply saying yes, 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 I wonder if our tone is as life giving as Jesus' tone was. Uh, I'm, I'm going to confess I've I've gotten hooked on the Chosen. Uh, the uh, the video uh, app series uh, that is uh, retelling the life of Jesus. And when it does uh, the Sermon on the Mount and it talks about Jesus teaching with an authority, it points to this tone, which allowed people to hear words they should have known and not hearing it. It, 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 it was convicting, but it was an invitational convicting. And I wonder if that's how we need to be preaching, knowing our congregations and are we able to have to, to use the words with the kind of punch that Eugene Peterson was trying to recreate so that it's convicting in a life giving way. I think, too, you, Matt, you mentioned what is the if we bring that lens of from what is Jesus liberating us? Uh, what it, where is it that we're experiencing liberation? And it's I, in the in the teaching on adultery and the teaching on divorce. I think one of the things that's important to note is in the, in this reinterpreting of the law uh, and and how the law has been. It's it, it's in part how has the law been used and or not fully been used in the way that, you know, that God intends. And so, you know, verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust and then verse 31, whoever divorces his wife. So to what extent there, there is mispractices of the law that deeply uh, that are, that are deeply abusive to women. And uh, that where women have been placed in in incredibly uh, abusive or oppressive situations, or that men have have abused their own power or abused the law to divorce at whatever a man chooses to, uh, and so that's that's part of this as well. Is it's a calling attention to. Uh, how is it that how is it that half of the population, in this case women, have been uh, have been abused by uh, the law uh, that that is in place, and so that calls for then a re understanding of what this law means and how is how is this law how does law need to be freeing? So okay. I think that's another that's another um, subtlety here. Uh, Warren calls it. Warren Carter talks about how it, to curb male power, mm -hmm. uh, and to to call out uh, um, the abuses of male power in a patriarchal society. I, I appreciate that that because um, I, I appreciate the commentary that that says that these are the heated discussions of the day that Jesus is speaking mm -hmm. into. And, and Caroline, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tweak. Um, your your language just a little bit. You said half the population, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add to it to say half of humanity that has been created in the image of God mm -hmm. have been oppressed. So you know it's it's like you know this is the image of God, and God's laws for flourishing, God's constructions for forming a flourishing community have been used to oppress to objectify and 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 to harm mm -hmm. half of the people that are part of the community mm -hmm. of god mm -hmm. matt matt i jumped in on you oh it's getting hot in here is all i was saying um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um caroline you you talked about you said half the population has been abused by the law Is it also fair to, I mean, is it more right to say have been abused by lawbreakers or been victimized by lawbreakers? I mean, is it the law's fault? 
Ah, yeah, well, that's okay. Or is what? it? Or is it? Right, humanity's fault. I'd right. say not I just think. men's fault because I, I think, I think women sin against women too. But you know, I, I, I get your point and grant all your points. But you know, I mean, is the problem the law, or is it the problem our sinfulness? I yeah, think that's, I think that's exactly fair. what we're talking about here. Is that yeah. Jesus? The, we've we've led up to this, so thank you, Matt, for 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 asking that um, because that's what it is. It, it is the um, oh, Caroline, you said it so wonderfully with those fancy words in, uh, earlier about the theological interpretation of reimagining the text. Now, that, whatever you said, was yeah, yeah, those. Well, I, I just I, and I, I asked the question. Uh, I asked the question because I don't want people to hear this passage and think, oh, the law is terrible. Exactly. And I, I want people to read this passage and say, oh, lot, humanity, right? humanity's terrible. Yes. Um, and I, I say this as somebody who I think has broken every single thing on this in this passage. Um, I can't drive to the store without saying you fool in my heart at least 20 <laughs> times. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so on the one hand, we, we can joke about it too like that. But mm -hmm. it's interesting too how some pass, some people zero in on certain sins here as way more important than other ones. That's and right. Yeah. That as well has been used to um, no, that, deny people's humanity in the church, right? And that, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's it. it and that's what it comes. That's why this is this. These passages are so important, mm -hmm. is because Jesus is pointing to where have uh, how has our sinfulness or our brokenness misused the law that is meant for flourishing. Mm -hmm. And so that that yeah that that. Um, um, but what I say, that nuance is really critical, yes. yeah. which is what I meant. But you know What's part of the beauty of the passage is that there's stuff in here that's like every day, who cannot do this yeah. next to stuff that mm -hmm. uh, some people manage to avoid in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I once heard a call in on a radio um, where uh, uh, a, a Muslim was saying, you know, people um, want to say that the Old Testament God uh, is harsher than nice little Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he used this text to say, I get an eye for an eye. I get, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 tooth for a tooth. I get this uh, uh, equity uh, of you do this and that's the punishment. But Jesus is going to your very imagination. Jesus is going to your thoughts. Jesus is going to your intentions. Ouch. And um, and and yeah, it's um, it, it's a higher standard. It is. Um, but I want to repeat that I believe that it is a, a offering of possibility for all of humanity and creation to flourish. Yes, and that's where I think I would direct us to Deuteronomy. We've referenced Deuteronomy before, mm -hmm. but I because the the standard or the litmus test for this for understanding or thinking about how do we live out God's law how do we execute God's God's law or how do we obey God's law that Jesus is calling out here in these verses is verse 19 choose life yeah choose life yeah. choose life and so if 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 what we're doing if God's law is not leading to life then there's something wrong there that there it is it is a naming of our as we said earlier our sinfulness our brokenness uh that is that how is it that 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 we have taken uh this intention of god of god's law as as life giving and relationship giving and relationship maintaining and sustaining and have twisted it to lead that leads us away from life, leads us away from flourishing. That's the critique. And while noting there are some specific commands or prohibitions in the Torah that I think are not life-giving. Mm -hmm. So how do we imagine, mm -hmm. when we talk about the law, we're talking mm -hmm. about a mm -hmm. system on the whole, and this is where Jesus's, you know, love God, love neighbor is so important as a right. centering device. Yeah. Yeah. So, this, yeah. so, so this is about honoring the God who is forming community um, and life this this promise in Deuteronomy is not merely how long we get to breathe, um, but it is um, moments of flourishing, the, the extent of our flourishing. So there was a, 
uh, she's she's a a mother now. Uh, but but there was a a kid in one of my churches that um, when she talked about instructions, she called them constructions. Uh, you know, just how kids hear and then say words off. And so she would she would always use the term. She'd say, "Well, have you read the constructions?" And I love that because if what God is doing is forming a community, then these instructions that are the, um, we, we call it the commandments, are actually constructions for forming a vibrant, uh, a flourishing uh, mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, it's participating, to use your words uh, uh, from last week, participating in what God is doing mm-hmm. to form a life-giving uh, community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which, of course, Torah means instruction exactly. in English, but much more than it means law or legislation. And so, exactly. Right. exactly. So then, for the psalmist to say, "When I, you know, I will praise you when I learn your righteous ordinances," you know, when the psalmist is talking about statutes, that's this is all part of God's Torah, God's. Mm-hmm. Right instruction for like you said construction or for formation yeah because i don't love a lot of the laws <laughs> right <laughs> you know, i really a lot of the specific ordinances in and of themselves taken as rules mm-hmm. i don't really love those but taken on the whole is imagining what is what are these ordinances working toward and from whom do they come mm-hmm. separated from the character of the god who gives them Mm-hmm. They mean not a whole lot to me, except for survival's sake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So but you keep them connected to the yeah the character of this deity, then yeah, and then let's talk. Yeah, yeah. So with with Psalm, uh, it's a we can look at these as a creative presentation of a constructive challenge, which is to obey and live. Um, and and the challenging homiletic turn that that I might suggest for this this text is not prescriptive or even descriptive, but to be inquisitive and to ask, and this this goes back to to the Matthew text as well. What is the one thing that we refuse to adjust in our life and practice um, that would enable us to follow God's higher calling? Mm -hmm. And and so to, to pose it as a question, Rather, rather than uh, a, a prescription or, or even a description, but to allow folks to sort of scratch their head. Matt, you were honest in saying, you know, you know, you can't drive on the streets without, you know, calling fool. You know, um, we say that with jest. But on the other hand, um, what is the one thing, you know, rather than I can find out what your sin is. I know where you're breaking the law. Turn that inward and saying, where, where, where's this text speaking to me? And, and I know we've been talking about community formation, but one turn for this might to be to allow this to, to punch home so that individually we ask ourselves, where am I not willing to follow God for God's bigger construction of a flourishing community? And I, I, one more thing about the psalm before we go to the Corinthians text, but I appreciated the uh, commentary, Joel Luan talking about the, the, the metaphor too of walking, Mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that the way to walk in the law is a lyrical way of describing what it means to follow the law in every respect, uh, and that it's it's the totality of one's behaviors and one's activities. And I like that with the walking because then the sermon, then the sermon puts and with all of this conversation, it puts us on a trajectory uh, that that is this is not a one time thing or this is not a this is the this we're going to, we're going to walk along this together and that we're not, this is not a, this is not a decision that one makes at this moment. I'm going to, you know, turn my life around or whatever, but it's this, has this consistency 
and uh, and that we walk along together. So there's something really important too, I think about that metaphor that we would want, perhaps want to bring in to say that, that, uh, yeah, that this is, this is, uh, this is going to, this is a part of our entire life. This is not something that we're not, we're not going to, we're going to talk about just on the sixth Sunday of Epiphany. Uh, this is, this is a life that we are called to that, that, expands the entirety of who we are and how we are in the world. It's a journey. Yeah. It and, is a journey. And, and, and you're allowing me to have uh, uh, the requisite uh, reference to Star Wars, or at least to the Mandalorian to say, this is the way. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yep. Star Wars folks will get that. <laughs> this is our, uh, our last stop in First Corinthians for now. Mm-hmm as Epiphany is nearing, or the season of Epiphany is nearing an end. So 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Talk about a prophetic, prophetic text in the epistles. Um, and, and it fits really with what you were just saying, Caroline. This isn't a, none of these are a one-stop moment because what is being described here by Paul in the first century, divisions abound. And, and we are still modifying our Christianity with whatever identity that is most critical to our belonging. Mm -hmm. And whether that's political or national or regional or denominational, um, we, we have different ways of putting ourselves in a group where we're, we're talking about who's, who we belong to. And, um, I, I just, I appreciate re being reminded through this text that in this journey, along this journey, and as people in this community God is forming, each one of us has a responsibility that is joined with others fulfilling their responsibility because ultimately the work is being done by God, not by us. Yeah, which is so key, right? It's not that following Jesus all of a sudden fixes all of the things we've talked about, about the law. And if anything was missing from our discussion of Matthew 5 in this podcast, it was what role does God play? Yes. Or what role does Jesus play in this community that we're talking about in this, in this human flourishing? And so Paul is helpful here. Mm -hmm. right? That conflict continues, but God is the one who will right. bring about the healing and the growth. Right. And it, it's a helpful it's a helpful place to land in when I think about our conversations the last this whole epiphany season and and that the communal aspect of of faith and and what that what that means and what that looks like. And so this our our human tendency when it comes to quarreling or when even when it comes to not fulfilling God's law is so much about uh is so much about individualism uh and and that that this sort of radical autonomy that that we love so much and and that Paul calling I belong to Paul I be, that's not no you belong to Christ yeah. and and to be and to belong to Christ means to belong to a community. And so in verse nine, we are God's servants working together, right? The verb is literally soon ergo, ergo working with, working together. And so this is we don't we, we don't do this alone. We do it. We do it together as a community. Thank God. Thank God.